Cook Report, The Lightman Report. Why did Arthur Scargill buy this house with a £100,000 loan from Russian money given for striking miners when the miners have hardly had a penny? A breezy July morning and the stage is set for the latest act in the saga of Arthur Scargill and the miners' money. We're here at the NUM conference to see what the miners have to say, forced once again to face up to the painful consequences of the strike. It's five years since the strike ended, but the row over how Scargill handled the money at that time is only now reaching a climax. Actually. In 1984, the High Court had ordered in accountants and lawyers to run the union's affairs. Scargill had to run the strike on cash donations. The donations totaled millions. But the question is, was all that money used for the benefit of striking British miners or not? A Cook Report special and a Daily Mirror investigation started it all, exposing dealings so secret and so bizarre that Scargill described the programme as a pack of lies and the NUM executive commissioned an inquiry carried out by Gavin Lightman QC. The report concludes that detailed legal advice is required to enable the NUM President Arthur Scargill, to recover millions of pounds that have been secretly diverted to the Paris-based International Miners Organization, President Arthur Scargill. The Lightman Report is a weighty document that takes some hours to read through. But when you do, you're left in no doubt whatsoever that despite Arthur Scargill's protestations that it's cleared him, it is in fact a damning indictment of his conduct. And this despite the fact that Lightman had to rely on limited and in some cases dubious evidence. At least one key document submitted by NUM officials is a forgery. The man who blew the whistle on Scargill is the NUM's former chief executive, Roger Windsor. And Windsor says he never signed this document at the centre of the row over the misuse of hardship money by NUM officials. But when the NUM submitted the document in evidence to Lightman, it was witnessed by Roy and Merrill Hyde, signed by Roger Windsor, and Mrs. Windsor. The names of the witnesses are well known to Angie and myself. The signatures are neither mine nor Angie's. And the two people concerned were not present when the document was signed. Indeed, nor could they be, because the document was never signed. Well, that looks like your signature. It does indeed. You're saying it's a forgery? It's a forgery. That doesn't look like yours, does it, Angie? No. That's not my signature. It's nothing like my signature. And I have proof of my signature here on my driving licence, which I'll gladly show. Which is there. The Hydes are close friends of the Windsors from pre-NUM days, and NUM officials knew that. It's just too ridiculous for words. I, I laughed because it was so amateurish. And I, I just couldn't believe that somebody could do something like that. I looked, I saw a copy of the document, and it bears no relation to our signatures. This is Roy Hyde's real signature. This is Merrill Hyde's real signature. And the address is wrong, too. Penderell Crescent doesn't exist. They actually live in Arundel Drive. Whoever copied their address got it wrong. What's more, says Mrs Hyde, they weren't even in Sheffield on the day this key document was supposed to have been signed. There again, I've got work records to prove that I was at work. Um, I'm sure it would have been in the term our son would have been at school, so there's no way that we could have been at Sheffield in the middle of the week. The Lightman inquiry had no way of cross-checking this because Roger Windsor declined to give evidence to a private inquiry which had no legal standing. 
Nevertheless, Lightman's highly critical findings have shocked and surprised many, including Michael Arnold, the court-appointed receiver who ran the NUM during the strike. Well, uh, I've been in the city for nearly 40 years. If Gavin Lightman had been appointed an inspector under the Companies Act uh, to a corporate entity, I believe that he would find it uh, necessary to hand this report uh, to the Serious Fraud Office. And what of Arthur Scargill's conduct in particular? One detects a tangled web. Uh, tangled webs, I was always taught, were set up to deceive. But for what purpose in this particular case, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to speculate. The tangle begins down the Russian mines, where the mine workers, some three million of them, say they each gave up two days' pay. They believed the money would go to the miners' solidarity fund, which would guarantee it got to the miners in need. Scargill denied any Russian money had been received, until we traced its route. It could have gone to England, but instead, as Lightman confirmed, it did a loop through Eastern Europe and on to Dublin, where it still sits in an IMO account. Onto the stage this week have stepped the Russians, independent trade union activists determined to retrieve their misappropriated money. And they say it's not one million pounds, but between three and five million. Yuri Bachenko is outraged by the Lightman report. I am disgusted. It's terrible. In any normal country, even in our society today, this is considered a criminal act. I would be very annoyed if Scargill is not brought to account for this. And I'll be very sad if the British people do not take him to court for what he's done. The key to whether there was more Russian money, and much more besides, lies inside the IMO's nondescript headquarters in a Paris suburb. The Organisation Internationale des Mineurs was set up by Arthur Scargill and Alain Simon, a French communist trade union official. Its main purpose seems to be the furthering of Scargill's political ambitions. The IMO has been a total failure. I mean, it was, it's always regarded by anybody who thought seriously about international relations as a Mickey Mouse organization. And what it turned into, in fact, was a, was a kind of piggy bank uh, for Scargill and for this unreconstructed Stalinist called Alain Simon in, over in Paris, who runs the Paris end of, of this outfit. It became a kind of piggy bank for their, their ideas about, uh, about some, some kind of revolution uh, which the miners would head. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's just a nonsense. The whole thing is a nonsense. Lightman says the finances of the IMO are practically impenetrable, especially as IMO president Arthur Scargill says he cannot procure any further information, and General Secretary Alain Simon gave an eventual downright refusal to cooperate. 1984, the soup kitchens at work. This is when the miners needed money most. The Russian money had been donated and could have got through, but it didn't, and the Lightman inquiry hasn't had a proper explanation. That angers former NUM executive committee member Trevor Bell. Mr. Scargill could uh, no doubt have uh, managed to arrange that uh, Alan Simon would give uh, full cooperation to the inquiry, because if, they've, if there's nothing to be hidden, then there's no reason for anyone whatsoever not to give the fullest information and the fullest cooperation with the people who are conducting the inquiry. In Paris last week, another Russian union activist looking for the missing money. At IMO headquarters, the front doors are now permanently locked. But even when Sergei Mosolovich got in, he didn't get very far. I wasn't able to see Mr. Simon because he is out of Paris on a business trip. The official I saw denied that the money collected by Russian miners was ever meant to help the British miners and their families. Further, I was told by this official he didn't have to explain to anybody how the money was used and that the whole thing is just a media plot. Oh. 
Durham yesterday. NUM delegates gather for an eve of conference gala. Arthur Scargill was there to unveil a plaque to commemorate the miners' struggle. Behind the scenes, there's now a struggle inside the NUM executive. There's talk of calling in the police. The executive want back the £2 million Scargill diverted to the IMO in Dublin. And there could well have been much more. Altaf Abassi represents Libyan interests in Britain. So how much money did the Libyans make available to the NUN? Uh, $9 million. And was there any concern about how that money had been handled? Well, uh, once money was uh, made available to them, what, what I understand that money was transferred to Europe and it was made available for trade union movement or NUM to use uh, as and when they find it necessary. But for hardship purposes only? Only for hardship purposes, yes, and nothing else. The request was made to Colonel Gaddafi by Roger Windsor. Scargill denied it happened, but we didn't believe him and neither did Gavin Lightman. He said Windsor was also likely to have given Gaddafi the secret bank account number in Warsaw. John Platts Mills QC, said Lightman, also asked for money on Scargill's behalf, even though, once again, Scargill denied it. Mr. Scargill gave me the assurance that he alone had drawing rights on that account. I know that I suggested uh, to Mr. Omar al-Hamdi, the, the Libyan chap, that he should give, if he could, or arrange for his government or his miners to give a, a good round sum, because the miners were in some need. But, uh, but I didn't dare suggest any figure, uh, nor did I to the Soviet Union. Altaf Abassi says the Libyans gave over five million pounds, but have now demanded and got most of it back because it didn't reach Britain. However, he does say he carried in briefcases full of cash, totaling 163,000 pounds, which did reach the NUM. Lightman says it can't be ruled out that Libya did donate money. When the report was published last week, Scargill put a brave face on it. Every member of the executive today has agreed that Arthur Scargill and Peter Heathfield have certainly not had their hand in the till. That was the most damaging allegation that was contained both in the Daily Mirror and on the Cook report, that we'd had our hand in the till and used personal monies for personal, uh, union monies for personal use. This is the scene Arthur Scargill is talking about and Roger Windsor described in our original programme. It's halfway through the strike, and Windsor is bringing a suitcase into NUM headquarters, stuffed with money from Libya, which Abassi has given him. Scargill counts out four piles of money. One for Nottinghamshire miners, one to pay off Windsor's bridging loan, another to pay for Heathfield's home improvements, and a fourth to pay off his own £25,000 mortgage. Lightman says in this respect, Roger Windsor is mistaken. I have no doubt that Arthur Scargill repaid his mortgage with two cheques on the 8th of August, 1984. But the report agrees that a cash payout like this did take place, most probably on the date Roger Windsor remembers, December the 4th, 1984. There is, however, disagreement as to where the money came from. Windsor is adamant that it was Libyan money. Scargill says it was taken from a brown paper parcel where he kept the cash for the Miners' Action Committee Fund. Lightman says the accounts for the MACF were drawn up years after the event in 1989. On the instruction of Mr. Scargill... ...and are... ...inadequate and misleading. So he can't tell where the money came from. The cash fund Scargill operated, or the Libyan money Roger Windsor insists he brought in. Lightman says Windsor's bridging loan was paid off. Heathfield's extension paid for, and Scargill was repaid £6,800 for work he'd had done on his house. Lightman continues, A few days after, Mr Scargill repaid the sum of £6,861 in cash into the brown paper parcel. And the only question which arises in my mind is why Mr Scargill did not use his own cash in the first place. 
For this payment, the report says there was a falsely dated receipt, one of a number of such dubious documents. I regret that it has been my strong impression that Mr. Scargill's story on a number of points has changed as it suits him throughout the conduct of this inquiry. Nevertheless, Mr. Lightman, who did not have the opportunity to question Mr. Windsor, while accepting that a cash payout did take place, says Windsor mistook the size of the pile of money Scargill counted out for himself. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that £25,000 was counted out of the Libya money by Scargill and given to Hudson. I didn't know the details of Mr. Scargill's mortgage, and in fact, until I read the report, it was the first time I'd seen in black and white that he did have a £25,000 mortgage. How he teamed and ladled, as he called it, the £25,000 to repay his building society, to repay the Yorkshire area of the NUM, to repay this and to repay that, I'm not privy to that information. But I do know that the £25,000 Scargill told Heathful and myself was to repay his home loan. The breakdown of it, I don't know, but there's no doubt in my mind that somebody is lying, and it certainly isn't me. Mr Scargill, even on one occasion, said that our bridging loan was repaid in August 1984, when in fact we were on holiday and he was looking after our dog, so presumably our dog repaid the bridging loan. Mr Scargill's report is so full of inaccuracies that you can't believe a word he says. Roger Windsor went through the inquiry documents and, apart from the forgery his friends didn't witness, he says he's found several more. For example, this receipt for the £29,500 cash payout we showed in the original programme. It's dated the 4th of December 1984 and countersigned by the union's then finance officer, Stephen Hudson. To my surprise, shock, the documents submitted to the inquiry have that same receipt, minus Stephen Hudson's signature, retyped in a different typewriter, redated from the 4th of December to the 29th of November, for what purpose I don't know, and my signature copied or forged from the original letter onto this forgery. Roger Windsor now lives in France. He recognises that he still owes someone £29,500. The Paris-based IMO is now suing him, but Lightman says the money is owed to the NUM. And he says the Russian money, which spun round Europe, rightfully belongs to British miners. Well, I don't there's any question in terms of his individual relationship with these secret accounts that it's the most unhealthy thing that I've ever seen. I've never known in my time in the National Union of Mine Workers or in any other organisation where one individual has had the power to be able to do and take the decisions that is done. It's a very unhealthy situation and one that should never have happened and should cease immediately. The report says that Scargill's dual role involves the risk of a sacrifice of the interests of the NUM, as has occurred, to the interests of the IMO. Whether £2 million is the final debt to the NUM has yet to be determined. Jim Parker, Scargill's former chauffeur and confidant, recalls taking £50,000 in cash from a Sheffield bank to Scargill's London flat a year after the strike. And after that, then I were told to come back and he were catching the plane next morning to Paris or wherever he were going. I used to ask, because of the money, why aren't I then taking him to Heathrow to make sure between there that nothing happened? He used to then say he used a hire car, which was a very costly private hire car, to take him to Heathrow. So again, I become very suspicious that because I didn't get paid any overtime, I was cheap labour. There was no reason why he sent me back, other than uh, not letting me know what was happening. So I suspect again that he was flitting money across what he was so-called uh, sending to uh, South Africa when he was taking it to France to do what with, who knows. Jim Parker, who once would have trusted Scargill with his life, has now lost all faith in him. The truth is, if you, are, if you could look at Arthur Scargill's bank account during the strike, you'd find that it's quite a lot of money. If you looked at Miner's bank account, you'd find that it was opposite way, the old a lot of money. Arthur Scargill didn't leave, uh, lose his home. What did Arthur Scargill end away after the strike? A new house. And this is it. Scargill bought this desirable residence shortly after the strike had ended, 
although he denied owning it for several years. He paid £125,000, and as miners struggled to recover from the strike, the Lightman Report reveals he paid for it with a £100,000 loan from the secret bank account in Dublin into which he'd siphoned the Russian hardship money. He's now repaid that debt, but in the circumstances, should he have taken the money in the first place? I think the members uh, who were campaigning throughout the year, and some of them suffering great hardship, uh, must be wondering whether they're in the same world as the officials that they elected when we can read, and I can learn from this report, that Mr Scargill had a loan of £100,000 without asking anyone out of a fund, and that Mr Heathfield can get £60,000 without asking anyone out of a fund, and that £13,000 is made available to repair Mr Heathfield's house during the strike and there were members walking around without 13 pence in their pockets. And they must wonder whether they're in the same organisation and uh, whether or not there is any accountability whatsoever. As the miners fought their battle, most accept that Scargill had to resort to a certain amount of financial subterfuge with the receiver in charge of the official bank accounts. But did that subterfuge really need to go on for years after the strike and include at least 17 bank accounts? Norman West, a European Member of Parliament, expressed his surprise in a letter released during the Lightman inquiry. A few weeks ago, he wrote asking about a quarter of a million pounds transferred into one account at Barclays Bank. This account at Barclays Bank appears to be in my name, and if this is the case, then as you will know, I have no knowledge of such an account, and I must be given some kind of explanation as to what it is all about. There are quite a few other people here in Durham today who don't know what's going on either. Perhaps they'll get a clue from Arthur Scargill's presidential speech. We saw for the first time in British trade union history the appointment of a receiver to take control of the union's assets. This led our union just like Star Trek, into areas where no union has ever gone before. And after the Lightman inquiry will probably never go again. Though Scargill himself behaved as though he'd hardly been criticised at all, devoting only the very last part of his speech to the current row. But he did admit that £1.8 million, much of it Russian money, still sits in an IMO-controlled bank account. There's been much speculation, especially in the media, about monies from the Soviet Union. And I don't care whether by agreement or whatever that money is determined belongs to the IMO, the MTUI or the NUM. I'd be more than delighted if they said it belonged to the NUM. They, of course, being Arthur Scargill and Alain Simon. Scargill made no mention of the Libyan money and offered no defence of the timing and secrecy of home loans made to himself and Peter Heathfield. He inferred that the forgeries might actually have been the work of Roger Windsor, though it should be said that Lightman dismissed Scargill's criticisms of Windsor in his report. Scargill implied that his handling of the union affairs during the strike had been exactly what the situation demanded and he laid his present troubles firmly at the feet of the media. Peter Heathfield and Arthur Scargill have been subjected to an unprecedented trial by media. And I simply want to conclude my address by asking members of this union to reject the character assassination of these who have traditionally been our enemies and yours. It's a privilege to be president of this great union. In a predictable speech, one concession. He'd be delighted if the IMO-controlled Russian money went to the NUM. As president of both organisations, he should easily be able to organise that. Tonight, French police launched an inquiry into the financial activities of the IMO. Our files, of course, are available to their British counterparts.